Hey everyone, this is Darren Verrier, Director of Publishing for Vineyard Worship. We release a new single on the first Friday of every month. Our latest single, Jesus Beautiful, is a rich modern hymn centered on both the deity and humanity of Jesus. Jesus, you are God, come near us, God here living with us, God within our reach. God's Find Jesus Beautiful and all of our singles wherever you listen to music. Moved to Austin, I'm sort of back in a charismatic environment and longing for the liturgy. I feel ungrounded, unanchored without it. Now that I've had this thing that was such nourishment for me and it's gone. And I am saying to people, can we like do some liturgy? And there's like blank faces, like nobody knows what I'm talking about because it's not, it's just not a thing that's done. So I just basically did my own thing. I just became a contemplative in my own house. You're listening to The Ferment Podcast, conversations about worship and transformation. Today's guest is Fran Pratt, the litanist. Fran is a pastor and the author of Call and Response, Litanies for Congregational Prayer. This episode is brought to you by Monk Drums. Monk Drums is a creative desert venture that strives to combine beauty and business as one heartbeat. Monk Drums' main focus is handcrafted wooden drums that allow us to love, assist, and serve all who accompany us on this path. Use the coupon code FERMENTPOD to get 5% off your Monk Drums order. Find them on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, at Monk Drums. And every Monday, look for hashtag Monk Drum Monday. Speaking from personal experience, monk drums are wonderfully crafted and they sound amazing. They blend the best traits of both the djembe and the cajon, and I found them to be incredibly versatile in both the live and studio environment. Check them out at monkdrums.com. This episode is brought to you by our friends at worshipteam.com. Worshipteam.com comes preloaded with over 12,000 songs, with new songs being added all the time. Hillsong, Bethel, Vineyard, Six Steps, Jesus Culture, just to name a few. Service building with Worship Team is a snap, and all the songs are completely legal and licensed. You can also find them on social media, Facebook at worshipteam.com, Twitter at worshipteam, Instagram at worshipteam underscore WT. Visit them at worshipteam.com for a free trial today. Complete worship planning with thousands of songs, easy interface, mobile apps, and legal rights for your church. All you need in one place, worshipteam.com. All right. Hey, everybody. I am with a very special guest, someone I've known for more than a minute, but haven't seen in a minute or two. I'm with Fran Pratt, the litanist. The litanist. That's right. I don't think I've um, 
That's a new one on me. That's I, a new title. I made it up. The Litanist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I made it up. I you, think I did. I Maybe I didn't, but. Um, we're going to call it yours. I like it. it yes. I think it fits. Yes. Yeah. And you're a litanist because you write litanies. Yes. Litanies. And we'll come back to that. I don't want to go there just yet. Okay. I guess we should do just personal history stuff, basic personal formation and where you came from. Um, why don't we just why don't we just start there? Where were you born? How did you grow up? Did you have a life of faith? Yeah. Uh, I grew up in rural Arkansas. Okay, mm. what was the city? Town, country, Berg. Chico County. Oof. Did it Arkansas. have a county seat? Was yes, there a little town? Of Lake Village. Lake Village. Yes, I grew up in that county, but I didn't go to school in that county. I went to school across the state line in Louisiana. And so I grew up in the rural South Bible Belt in the, yeah, all in that. the belly of, should I say, denominational names? You can. Okay. Well, I grew up in, in, you know, the SBC. Yes. And uh, I was a weird kid, a nerdy, booky kid, and didn't really fit in there. <laughs> yes. And so I dropped out of high school and went to college and uh, started deconstructing. Yes. Then. That was about 1990. I think I went to college in 1999. Okay. So you grew up, but you had a family, your family were, were all believers? Yes. Oh, yeah. yes. Like everybody, cousins, grandma, the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of typical yeah. Southern Just family. Typical churchy Southern family. Listen to Focus on the Family on the radio. Yes. That whole bit. Yep. Yes. Um, and I remember a moment in college where like kind of the exclusivity of everything came into focus for me. And I remember having this, this, this visceral moment. I was swimming at the natatorium and, uh, I was, I was angry because I had seen some injustice within the church sphere and my then boyfriend now spouse was, came to the end of my lap and there were his feet at the, at the pool's edge. And I tore off my cap and I tore off my goggles. And I said, I don't want to be a Christian anymore. Yeah. And that was the first moment of my like. Reconsidering. What is, what is it that we're how old doing were, How here? old were you? I was probably 18 or 19. 18 or 19. Yeah. You had left high school already. You were in college. Yep. Was mm -hmm. he a little older than you? No, he's, I mean, he's a year older, but we were the same year. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. you're just, was this freshman year of college? I don't, or, I, or sophomore? sophomore. Yeah. Cause you left a little early. Mm -hmm. Okay. Were you a swimmer? Well, I was a little bit at the time. You were just, Not you, were just, a, you, were, just you were on the I team. Just you were just getting swimming. some aggression out. <laughs> okay. So yeah. So <laughs> you just releasing. Okay. So what were you thinking about in the pool to have such a visceral reaction? You were just I was, the injustice of, yeah. of just the church or what have yeah, you? Well, there, there was this thing where uh, the church didn't want us to co-mingle with other denominations. Oh, got it. Got it. it, it they didn't want us to so be by influenced. Yeah, by exclusivity. Yes. It, you, you meant even like denominational purity. Yes. So like these <laughs> other folks yeah. were heretics and therefore we were not allowed yes, of course. to. So and like that theme right there of like these other folks are heretics of and course. we can't associate with them is an ongoing theme of me like waking up to that. Yeah. Well, it just highlights just how darn tribal we can be, we're right? We're so tribal. Like in our, yeah. like deep, deep down, we're always sort of dividing the world, us versus them, right? Yes. And so I feel like a major theme of my whole faith journey is moving into oneness and unity and wholeness. Yes. And away from all that separation. Okay. So when you came out of the pool, you take your cap, you take your goggles, you slam it. I don't want to be a Christian anymore. Uh, did you have a season where you, where you lived as not a Christian? I did not live as not a Christian. Okay. I couldn't, I, I could not shake the Christ. Yeah. I couldn't. You're couldn't God feel, haunted. I am God. I am Christ haunted. Yes. 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 Jesus was, you know, Anne Lamott talks about the kitten nipping at your heels. If you've ever read any like Anne Lamott. Yes. It was like that, but I don't know. Yeah, you can't. More intense. You can't shake it. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. So still the Christ felt very real to me. And that was just the start of me like taking down the layers, almost like peeling off layers of wallpaper, layers of wallpaper, wallpaper, wallpaper over the years. So then um, graduate college, marry the boyfriend. We move far away from the South into the Midwest, which is a culture shocked. We are saying... We're never going to be a part of denominational faith again. Anything that smells like the church that we came from, we're not going to have anything to do with. We're like done. Yeah. So we, uh, we opened up the yellow pages in Iowa city, Iowa, which is where we lived. We had, go for work. Well, we had, we'd flipped a coin about who was going to go to graduate school first. Okay. And I got in at one place and he got in at the University of Iowa. We had applied to all the same places. Yes. This was really weird. I do not recommend doing life this way at all. So but you've grown. we did it. Yeah, it's okay. We were real young and stupid. Um, so we flipped a coin and the coin toss went to him. So we moved to Iowa City, Iowa for <laughs> him to go to grad school. And... It was like the hardest years of our life. I because, mean, because it's of just culture shock. Yeah. We were poor. Oh gosh, we were poor. And you're trying to get through school. And we're like, what did you do? I, I bartended. Yeah. And like cleaned tanning beds at yes. a. Just gym. cleaning the oils off I of those just, tanning beds. That is what I did for yes. several years until I finally got like a more stable job. Um, but that first weekend we got there. Open up the yellow pages, and there is an ad for Vineyard Community Church of Iowa City. And the tagline was, strong coffee, rock and roll, and Jesus. Yes. And we were like, all right, let's go there. I'm in. We're in. And you just went. And we went. And they became our family, and they they grew us up. Like, they, they mentored us. And, like, there were couples in that church that... You know, we'd be like fighting in those early years of of, ma- of our marriage, and yeah. it would be like nine or ten o'clock at night, and we would call them and say, "We're having a fight, and we're about to kill each other. Yeah. We're like we're about to murder one another. Yes. Help!" Yes. And they would say, "Okay, we're putting the coffee on." Yeah, and like you're fine. We come su- over. Like we survived because yeah. those guys mm-hmm. poured into us. And that was the first time I ever saw any kind of any woman doing any leadership at all. Okay. Was that Um, important to you? Well, I didn't. Or did you not even know it was important? I didn't know it was important because I wasn't even awake to that, that, like that being a possibility. Yeah. Not at all. It would have never, I mean, I think that I would have been a person who, who I would have thought that I was some sort of priest, probably some sort of pastor, some sort of minister, but it never even crossed my mind because I was so entrenched in patriarchal religion. Yeah. And it's interesting. I was having a conversation with a friend just yesterday about how the size of our frame really determines what we see and and then how we see, right? So if you grow up, if you grow up in a church world that doesn't have women in leadership, the thought or the part of your brain that can conceive of women in leadership is just, it, it's gone. Well, it's yeah, not there. It's, it's, it's it not undeveloped. It's, it's just not there. It's undeveloped. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you move to Iowa city, you go to the vineyard, rock and roll, strong coffee, mm-hmm. uh, and people help care for your marriage and show you women in leadership, but you're poor and yeah. you're struggling and you're living <laughs> in culture shock. Uh, yeah. You look back on it now. Is it warm, fuzzy feelings? It is. Okay. Like yeah. I got to, I have, I feel so fondly about um, re, b- like beans and rice and watered down orange juice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, that's, that's like, how you know I you're really poor. I really think everybody needs to go through that in life. <laughs> well, speaking of when Heather and I were first married, we were talking about this the other day. We remembered that our weekly grocery budget was $30. Yes. And we lived on 30 bucks. Yes. That was it. Yes. And if we could get by on 28, we would rent a movie. Exactly. People, I tell my kids that and they fall on the floor laugh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was us. That was us just working our tails off. But it was, you know, it, I think it was really formative and good. Yeah. It's interesting. You, 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 you would not wish struggle upon someone. 
but there's some, there's a gift inside of it sometimes, you know? I think there is. Yeah, I do too. I, I totally do. Father Roar says love and suffering are our greatest teachers. And yeah, I don't you hate really, that second part? I really believe him. I really mm. believe him though. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what was Hubby studying? He's a designer. He's a graphic designer. Okay. What did you get your undergrad degree in, by the way? Oh, do I have to tell you? <laughs> I Well, no. This is your I story. I was an English major and I've really come full circle with that. Oh, you say that with some mm-hmm. embarrassment. What's the deal? Well, I, you know, You're a writer. nobody You're wanted a writer. me. Come on, nobody friend. wanted me to, to be an English major. Like that was sort of universally, um, at least among my family and parents. Yeah. Like regarded as not a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> and I. Yeah. What are you going to do with that? Friend? It was my, it was yeah. one of my first rebellions, really. Mm. Mm-hmm. One of my first, like, no, this is what my heart says. So I guess that's a good thing. I guess I should reframe that in my mind of like, no, that was like maybe the first time I listened to my soul. Yeah. So is there, I'm even like picking up on this now. Is there just something in you that wants to go against the grain? For sure. Okay. Yeah. Is that like always? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. I, I think it is. I, you know, um, what are they called? The stages of the one, the one through four. Yeah. Like the stages of spiritual development that, or whatever. Yes. Yeah. I pretty much live in that three space <laughs> yes. of that, like, yes. that, like sort of teenage, I've got to push against the system. Okay. Hey, and if you don't mind me asking, how old are you? I am 37. Yeah. I mean, you, you had formative years in the 90s as well then. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There was just yeah. I also, I mean, I think, you know, some of this is personality. Some of this is like how we grew up and were raised. And I, there's something about like kids of the 90s. There's, yeah. There was angst in the 90s. Yeah. That I still was. feel very connected to. You I know? do too. Yeah. My, my wife is is oftentimes like, you're just so on fire. Like, Like, can you just calm down a minute? You know, it's like, well... Yes, I'm working on that. Yeah, I think I don't, um, I don't feel aggressive. Yes. I just feel like, um, I don't know, I'm just okay with being alone, alone or, or like doing my own thing yeah. with regards to some of that. So Okay. And yeah. part of that showed up in, even in your English majorness. Yeah. Okay. Um, beyond Beyond maybe the part of you that likes to go against the grain a bit. Did you get your English major because you loved literature? Is it is it is it the art part of you? Because I know that you're a writer now. I know that you're a songwriter. You're a worship leader. Mm-hmm. You're, you wear a lot of hats. Mm-hmm. Um, was was there some of that? Did you love literature? What, it was to- yeah. All it was of just that. a love of literature, okay. and also because books had been my best friends. You know, I mean, I, I had friends. I had good friends. But look, I mean, I was just this introverted kid, and I was living in this tiny little community where everybody knew everybody's business. And, you know, I really would have benefited from like a drama, like a theater department or like a choral something or a band or, you know, I never even saw a girl play a guitar literally until I got to college. Yes. Never in my life saw a woman except on TV, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So, um, I didn't pick up a guitar until I was in my mid twenties. Yeah. So books, books were a way out of your so for sure they were my friend and they were my escape. Into a new and, world. Yeah, something yeah. to make me interested. Okay, yeah. so what did you like to read? Novels. Yeah. Fun. Um, Adventure. Who? Do you have a favorite author? Or did you? Or did now? I at the time? Like I don't know. Gosh, I don't even. I don't even know I'm always very remember. interested in people's reading preferences. I, I loved Saul Bellow really? back back in those days. Yeah. Why? He just seemed really deep. Mm-hmm. I haven't read him in years, but he at the time really, it did the, it did the trick at, for you. Yeah, at the time it it did the the angsty. It like fed that angsty thing in me. <laughs> okay, mm-hmm. and so to flip back to this moment in Iowa when you're at the vineyard and you're seeing women do th- do things, women lead, women lead worship. Mm-hmm. Did you see women, women preach. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Was that culture shock as well? It was. Did it freak it, you out? It it required a lot of mental gymnastics that I didn't have the theology for yet to really to really do. Mm-hmm. So so we, I had to like 
you know, oh, well, um, she has to do this under the covering of her husband because that's all the, that's all the theology I knew. I didn't know any other language for that. And I didn't know any way to, um, any other hermeneutic for looking at scripture. So there were a lot of mental, mental gymnastics that took some years to get some language around and, and yeah, figure those... out and then go, oh, thank God. No wonder I felt uncomfortable all these years. No wonder I felt like a fish out of water all, yeah. all these years. Uh, when, when in that moment did you feel like, well, this could be me? Was that where you started feeling like, oh, this could be me? You know what? It was a, a 30-something-year-old man who saw me, he was the worship pastor. His name is Jason McCoy. Hello, Jason. I Hello, love you. Jason. I just give you so much gratitude. Um, he saw me and he, he was able to call it out and say, hey, friend, I think you could lead worship and I'll help you and I'll teach you and I will um, let you play sets with me. And then gradually give you the set and then, then I won't play with you at all. And I'll just sit and, you know, yeah. and so he took me step by step and, yeah. and helped. And I, you know what, I want to pay that forward so many times, yeah. so many times, yeah. to young, especially to young women who don't yeah. think they can do a thing. Yeah. So beyond leading worship, were you having thoughts of speaking at that point or was that, is that later? I think, I think somewhere I probably wished that I could speak. I just wasn't quite awake to it yet. Yeah. I wasn't awake to maybe that I could do that yet. Isn't it funny how we have to take little tiny steps? Yeah, I do. I do have to take little tiny steps. But then when I decide I'm ready, then I'm ready. Yeah. Baby steps <laughs> so, to the elevator. Right. And then, then I'm ready to go. Press the button. Let's go yeah, all the way down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how many years did you lead worship? Before you were like, okay, maybe there's something more for me. 14. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. it might have been like 12 because I probably had those inklings for enough, for two years before. before yeah. and, 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 then, and maybe it took me, a, like I, I had a lot of resistance because here's the deal. I didn't have, okay, I had a couple, I had some good pastors there in Iowa City. Yeah. And then I had some good pastors also in San Francisco, which I haven't really gotten to that yet. Yeah. <laughs> that the way we did eventually move to San Francisco and saw some good pastoring, but I didn't have like a high view of, of, of pastoral ministry, you know, like I just had been burned and like seen some bad pastoring Yeah. and Oh, I'm no, never, yeah. Never going to be a pastor. No, 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 never. Yeah, so beyond your own life experience, some of, and by life experience, I mean early life experience in theology, you had some personal, maybe more present life experience that kind of kept that walled yeah. off a little so bit. Yeah, so I resisted that idea yeah. for a long time, I yeah. think. Okay, so what would you what would you tell women who are listening right now? Maybe we could just go meta here for a second. What would you tell women who are listening right now and they're like, I think there might be more for me? <sighs> Well, um, I would say that's probably your soul talking and you probably should give her some space and get quiet enough to be able to hear her because she might not know how to speak very loudly just yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting how that works. Yeah. You use the word your own soul. There's this sense in which we kind of know, we already know, don't we? Yeah, like, I think we do. Yeah, yeah I kind of do too. I kind of think oftentimes the most important things about our lives we we do know, and then we we struggle to say it, or we struggle we struggle to come to grips with it, or we struggle to to own it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think a lot in terms of consciousness. Yes, of what we're conscious of and what we're suppressing, and so becoming conscious of what your soul might be telling you is mm-hmm. is important and. I mean, I say that, I think I say this kind of a lot, but it's just harder for women because of the way society has, has been so patriarchal. It's just harder for women because we've been taught not to listen to our own souls and we've been taught, we've been, we've been trained in this. And so, you know, we haven't had all that much time to really learn like your average woman who's not who wasn't like a 
at the forefront of the suffrage movement. Yes, you know? of course. Um, you use the word patriarchy. Um, just for people who are listening, why don't you, why don't you just tell us in general what you mean by patriarchal training for a <laughs> moment? Well, it's this idea and reality that the world has largely been imagined by the male perspective and implemented in ways that come naturally to how the masculine functions. So if I'm bold and it's affirmed and then I lead with typical testosterone-soaked male boldness, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Which isn't always a bad thing. It can nope. be a very good thing. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. but if, to your point, if the world is imagined, shaped, formed, replicated, yes. and blessed. Yes. So then the feminine way that might have a different imagination, yes. well, just it mostly doesn't exist in the world. Yes. The, the feminine imagination of, well, how might, how might, what might the church w have looked like if if women had been part of the Council of Nicaea? Well, there's a question. Like, it would have probably would have looked totally different. It's a decent question. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. Did that answer the question? <laughs> no, I think it's good. I think that's good. I think it's a great understanding. It's, it's real basic and it's concise for people who are maybe you know, waking up to these realities or, or struggling to think about it. Yeah, I think it's perfect. It's, it's like the world has mostly been shaped and formed by men and, and not just by men. I would even say a particular kind of man. Yes, like, you're right. Like the strongest, boldest. Really the male eights of the yes. world. <laughs> uh, could be me. It is right. me. But, yeah. but that energy, I yeah. like to use the word energy in this conversation, yeah. which is not always bad. It can get a lot of good stuff done. But if it's the only... One that gets rewarded in the then, right. Then then all of a sudden we end up in a system where where my very sweet, nurturing, kind number two wife. Right. There's less space or even value, right? Yeah. yeah. So I, I I yeah. So that would be I think that's a great understanding for how patriarchy sort of works. Yeah. And so then the the fallout, the fallout is that women don't know how to want things and they don't know how to say what they want and they don't necessarily know how to like elbow them elbow their way into the the power the the power circle to maybe get what they want or say, or or have a voice and so i just think that um we we have to and this is not just women's work this is men's work as well to to widen the circle, widen the circle and ask and ask, well, what do women think about this? Yeah. And yes, it's women taking, a, becoming more like asserting power and coming into, to our power. But there's a, there's a, a, a partnership that's, that's well, I was having a very in interesting conversation. This has been a few weeks ago and I think it's going to come out on the podcast here real soon. In fact, by the time you listen to this, it will have already been out. But I had a, a really interesting conversation with uh, Shyla and Leon Powell, two African-American worship pastors in the vineyard. And I can't remember if it was Shyla or Leon who said it, but one of them said it. And it was just really brilliant because they were talking about their African-American experience of, of being minorities in a white dominant culture, which is a different conversation than this one. But it does have some... It has resonance, doesn't it? It does yes. have resonance, right? Mm -hmm. And so they were talking to me about how... It's a different thing for a white dominant culture to say to minorities, um, you're welcome here. That's, that's one thing, and that's a good thing to say. But, but another thing, and maybe another, I'm using air quotes here, higher level thing that we could say is this space was made for you. Or this space was made with you in mind. Right. That's very, very different from even your welcome. Or this space is open for you to interpret and you to imagine. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So and that's part of what I'm hearing you say. It's like, well, it's not just even about um, it's not just about making a place where a woman could do something. But like, are we making some spaces where women could help imagine it? 
Yes. And I mean, I think that uh, I think patriarchy and white supremacy are two sides of a of a coin, which is, well, for lack of a better word, let's call it hierarchy or systems of domination. Um, and yes, I think they do have some resonance and we have a responsibility to kind of get out of the way for our siblings of color. into this conversation on female leadership here uh we're at my church right now and i've been the lead pastor here for 11 years and before that i was worship pastor here for almost nine years Uh so i've been here a long time Mm -hmm. um and so i led worship a ton here for nine years and then when ray hollenbach tapped me on the shoulder to take leadership from him, I started immediately praying, God, who, who is supposed to be the worship pastor here? That was like my first thing. Before I thought about any other spot in the church, I was thinking like worship, which is, I think, pretty normal for worship leaders. We we value that. And as clear as day, I mean, one of the clearest words I've ever heard from the Lord in my life, I felt like God told me, you need to hire Hannah. And it was very interesting, Hannah Darty to Spain. It was very interesting because at the time, she probably would not have been the most obvious choice in the moment. And may not have imagined it for her own self. <laughs> yeah. And so I talked to her, we got it all worked out and she began to lead worship. And what was interesting to me is in those first two years, we saw our church grow in so many different ways, not just numerically, but in soul and in spirit. And it was just very obvious to me that the reasons why, beyond just the unique, very, very unique gift that she has, which is kind of unlike anything I've seen yeah. with anyone else, it, it it occurred to me that some of this had to do with just uh, f- just female energy and leadership up front it's every just week. the other half of every being week, human. Every week. That's right. Every yeah. week. We're just putting female energy back into the system, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, it changed our church. Yeah. Well, and everybody's hurting for lack of it, yeah. not just the women. Yeah. The men are hurting for lack of it as well. The, yeah. the, the boys. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Well, that is, that's very, very cool. So when did you start waking up? Was it in San Francisco? Was it some other point along the way to, gosh, Man, maybe my, maybe, maybe the thing that God is doing in me isn't just worship leadership. Maybe it's leadership. Yeah, that probably came after San Francisco. That, came, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure it did. Uh, I think it came after I had a couple of babies. And there's kind of like a growing up thing that happens like this. I don't, or that happened for me. For whatever reason, I just, it wasn't that I needed to prove something to my daughters, but kind of it was like, like what is in me that needs to come out and what, and yes, I like, I just have a greater sense of urgency for, to, to, to allow it now that I have some daughters, cause I have two daughters and I am raising strong women and I, you know, that just seemed more urgent. Well, part of what I'm hearing you say here is uh, your may, maybe the secret hopes for yourself were ignited in the in the hopes that you could see for your daughters. Right. And I'm like, I don't want to project it onto them. I actually need to embody it yeah. right now in yeah. my own in yeah. my own life. And then I started writing liturgy. And and writing liturgy well, it's, trend, I mean, it's transformed to me. Like, yeah. Okay. And let's just take a time out right here. Yeah. What do you mean by writing liturgy? Well, okay. I write, primarily I write congregational prayers for 
a church and or small group and or whatever kind of yeah. gathering and, and gatherings of human beings. And they're call and response. Call and response. Most are. Yes. I do write a few that aren't. Um, to pray together aloud about specific things, usually specific topics. Let's pray into this one thing. Okay. How did, yeah. how did that practice start? By necessity. So we had, we had moved, uh, for job her reasons to San Francisco. And I started, we started attending a church that was a half mile away from our apartment there. And I was pregnant and I was like, I'm willing to walk a half a mile and that's it, yeah. <laughs> you know? And, and it was so, yeah, there's no parking in San yeah, Francisco. There's no parking and yeah. I'm like, there's hills and my, I have this huge pregnant belly and that's just as far <laughs> as I'm going to go guys. Yeah, I'm making a circle right here. This <laughs> yeah. is it. And, um, so we start going to city church in San Francisco, which is an RCA church, which is reformed church of America. And they are liturgical and it is a beautiful church. Beautiful. If you are in San Francisco, please go visit city church in San Francisco. Was that your first foray into a, a first... liturgical expression? experience of liturgy. What, what did that do to you? Time, I was in was having a lot of grief and identity crisis because we'd had to leave Iowa City and I had had to leave my my worship ministry and like all the songwriting that we were doing in that community and things were growing and things were burgeoning and and I was growing and I was finding my voice as an artist and as a songwriter and um my, like my own rhythm as a as a leader. And then boom, we have to leave. Yeah. So you felt like you had traction. So I and then, had lost. I felt like just I had lost everything. Just yeah. all of a sudden I lost, lost it all. So the, the first time in my life, I feel like, oh my gosh, I might have a calling. Like mm. I might have a calling from God. Yeah. And then boom, poof, it's gone. Boom. So I'm like, I'm kind of a funk for a couple of years. I was in a funk. I was in a depression. Probably not like a true depression, but you know, just, just sad. I was sad. Yeah. And lonely. We had just moved to San Francisco. I didn't have any friends there, and pregnant. And so we're in. We're we're going to City Church, and they hand me this paper that has these words on it, and the words are beautiful, and they're prayer, but they're also poetry, and they're like they they're addressing current events, and they're praying for the government, and they're praying for the homeless people, and they're and and like. Like really it's very digging in. Very contextualized to the city, it, the moment. Yeah. And really just just digging in. And there's there's ancient, but there's also some fresh stuff. And the music is it's got the same like ancient and new resonance that was beautiful. And also they had a jazz band that was like amazing. And so I would stand there in the back, you know, my like charismatic heart is standing in the back of, of these, these folks and my, I've got this big pregnant belly and tears streaming down my face. Are you raising your hands? And I'm raising my hands. Yes, you are. You're a true I am charismatic. raising my hands That's right. in the back of the Russian center <laughs> in San Francisco. And I, I, that was like the only prayer I had prayed because I, I was in a funk and I, I didn't know what to say to God. Yeah. I could, and I couldn't really stand the Bible at the moment, you know? Isn't it interesting that liturgy and specifically a pre-written call and response prayer really ministered to your charismatic, spontaneous heart? Oh boy, did it. I mean, it well, was... Did it shock you? It it surprised me. And I, I came into the room with resistance, like feeling like, because I had all this programming that's like, oh, well, the only way to pray, the best way to pray is extemporaneously and, oh, let the Holy Spirit lead you. and the Holy, you know, Maybe speak that. in tongues. Huh? Yeah. Whatever. Right. Right. And I had that programming and then I get handed this liturgy that is so beautiful and it's giving me words to say that I don't have coming out of my own self. And they're probably, well, no, they are better and more formational than anything that I was would have been praying out of my own imagination. And like that, it, that formed me. It Like it did you, really kept my ship from sinking. Did you start writing prayers there? Not yet. Okay. So you're just, you're just reading just, their prayers. I'm just, I'm, I'm praying soaking it up. I'm just, right. whatever you hand me, I trust you and I'm going to, I'm going to say it out loud and I'm going to say the Apostles Creed every week and I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to do it all. 
I'm going to say the Lord's Prayer. I'm going to cross myself. I'm going to go let somebody look me in the eye and say, this is the body of Christ broken for you. And yes. this blood of Christ shed for you. And then I bought a book of common prayer. I started doing and, a little bit of that at home. Yeah. And so, so gradually, gradually, well, fast forward, we move to Texas. We move to Austin. I'm sort of back in a charismatic environment and longing for the liturgy. I feel, I feel ungrounded, kind of unanchored without it. Now that I've had this thing that was such just nourishment for me and it's gone. And I am saying to people, can, can we like do some liturgy? And there's like blank faces, like nobody knows what I'm talking about because it's not, it's just not a thing that's done. Um, so I just basically did my own thing. I just became a contemplative in my own house and read the book of common prayer and sort of did my thing. Yeah. Not at church. Meanwhile, leading, you know, five you're, rock songs. You're leading worship on Sunday mornings. <laughs> Sunday mornings. But your heart is somewhere else. Yeah. I mean, not that my heart wasn't in the worship because it was. I just knew that there was something, there was more. something more for me. There was something, there was something like a protein shake, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> anyway. All right. So you're leading worship at this charismatic church, five rock songs on a Sunday, but there's just something in your heart that's missing. Yeah. I miss it. I'm longing for that ancient, like richness that this resonance and this connection to something that is old, that is or, you know, original to Christianity and that existed before, you know, drum kits existed. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, um, so I just did my thing at home by myself, like trying to learn to become a contemplative and reading Merton and reading Father Rohr and, um, you know, Barbara Brown Taylor and trying to become a contemplative on my own. So then some things started happening. It was... The war in Syria. Yes. I think there were some other things, some other kind of tragic events that occurred. And I was pushing for us to address those corporately in service. And how can we address that in a way that allows for corporate engagement? And so I remembered that litanies exist and there's that the book of common prayer exists. So I spent, I would spend hours Googling and trying to find litanies that would work for this kind of, you know, diverse group of, of folks that were in this particular church. That's a more of a casual setting they're not really, they don't really know what liturgy is. They're, that's not part of their tradition. That would be totally new to them. So how do I like help them with, uh, help us address this thing corporately, but also not shock them and turn them off. And wh what can we do? So I'm Googling and I'm Googling and I'm Googling and I don't find anything that seems like it works. And for whatever reason, I was like, well, okay, I'm going to write it. DIY. So I wrote one. And then I wrote a few more. I think this was like 2013 or something. Do you remember what the first one was? I think it was something about Syria. Mm. I think so. Yeah, something something to respond to tragedy. Something to respond to tragedy, yeah. I could look in my archives and see what the first one actually was. That's probably a good question for me to know the answer to. Um, so then, uh, and then just randomly, I don't know why I did this but I shared them on the worship leaders forum. I remember when you did. I don't know what possessed me to do it, but I did. I don't no. know why. Friend, and that's when we started using them here. Yeah. I never, listen, this is so funny. You're really kind of an important person in my spiritual journey and then the journey of this church because oh, wow. you posted it on the worship leaders uh -huh. page. I read it and I was moved by the subject, but I was also moved by the language. And I think I sort of intuitively knew that we could take this little 20 line prayer, mm -hmm. insert it into a Sunday morning. It doesn't cost us anything. And by cost, I mean 
time, three minutes, time yeah. or learning. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like it was, it's very low cost, mm-hmm. but it, 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 it rounds out our worship experience in a brand new way. Yeah. And I just, we started doing them. Yeah, it kind of feels like low hanging fruit. It's so low. Every every time <laughs> I meet, just grab it. It's right well, there. And every time I meet someone, especially from charismatic traditions, this is one of the things that I always suggest. I'm like, you just need to add call and response prayer to your service because it doesn't it it doesn't take away the spontaneity. Yeah, it doesn't. It's not a negation of any of the things we value no, in Holy it isn't. Spirit it ministry. It doesn't negate anything. It's just an addition. Yeah. It's an addition that doesn't cost anything. And then it it is it's a really great way to uh pray into some things we maybe don't know how to pray for or hold space for moments we don't know how to hold space for. Yeah. It's also I I'll just share this and you can agree or disagree. But I found here we're in Kentucky. This is a super conservative rural area that I love. I love these people, yep. right? They're not progressive, but there's a way for me to hold space on issues of grief, pain, injustice, um, I don't lament, know, lament that that I that I couldn't do if I just like addressed it directly head on pastorally. You know, I could make a, I could stand up in front of the church and make a direct pastoral quote unquote statement yep. and it'd be so much less effective. But if I, if we were to read, for instance, your lament slash call and response prayer for a terrorized city, mm-hmm. which by the way, you have one. Mm-hmm. We used it a couple weeks ago mm-hmm. because we needed to again. It keeps coming up, unfortunately. Yes, it does. Yeah. Um, and it's a perfect way to like it's a back door kind of it into people's per- heart. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. It really is. And yeah, it, it just is. it bypasses a unfruitful political discussion. Yep. And it actually gets to the heart. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's I'm a fan. Well, I appreciate that. I'm Thank a you. Fan. Thank you very much. And I remember so those early those early days of me just kind of dipping my toes into writing those things. And I went to a Southeast Retreat. And I'll ne- I remember Mike O'Brien, I met him for the first time. I'd never been to one of those. I'd never been to one at all. I don't know why I had never been to one. It was yeah. so weird. I don't know why. Anyway, it was the first one I went to. And I, in, someone introduces me to Mike O'Brien and Mike O'Brien goes, Fran, you're the litany girl. Yes. And I was like, uh, well, okay. Yeah. I, yeah, I guess I am. That's right. <laughs> I guess I am. That's right. And so then in 2014, 15, my husband, who's a designer, gifted me a website for Christmas. And that was when I started posting litanies with just more intention and discipline. And and you started writing to lots of different subjects. Yes. So even on your website right now, there is hundreds, hundreds of litanies and they cover lots of different topics. Yeah. And you can search by title or by theme or by scripture. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I just I just want to say, like, since your website in particular went up, we haven't done them every week, but goodness gracious, we've done them almost every week. Oh, yeah. And I had a guy, I'll tell you this story. This is from not long ago. I had a guy at the church here who's been at our church forever. He's a um, He's a PhD teacher at the university. And he came up to me and said, hey, you know, my favorite part of worship, it's when we do call and response prayer. And I realized a couple things in that moment, that the more diverse and varied our worship expression is, the more it's making on-ramps for different kinds of intelligence or different kinds of people. Yes. Or another metaphor that I like to use a lot is, that's not my metaphor, but it's a metaphor, is that of a feast, like a buffet of dishes that appeal to a wide variety of palates. That is right. And and um, how do we get everybody's soul nourished? Yes. Like we want everybody to leave the door having, be, having received nourishment for their souls and formation for their spiritual journey. And that just, it. The, look, I love worship. Yeah. I do. I'm, I, I do. Same. But 
it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not going to resonate for every single person. And not everybody is wired in the way that it takes for you to, you know, stand in the back of the room and raise your hand. Right. <laughs> it's just not, it's just not true yeah. for everybody. And, and it's not, and it's not always needed. Right. Yeah. Well, and here's the other thing I've, I've, I've noticed in your writing, especially on the call and response part. I've noticed, I've noticed that you're a theologian in a way. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, not in, not in that classic way of writing academic books or. I think I'm a guerrilla the theologian. Yeah. You, yeah. You, you, you go in mm-hmm. and you take the best, right? Mm-hmm. But it's very pastoral because what you're actually doing is. You're taking high concepts about the nature of Jesus, Mm -hmm. um, the brokenness in the world, God's plan to redeem, like all of these things, right? And you're giving it back to people in common language Mm -hmm. that is also at the same time poetic. And so I've noticed that there's a teaching aspect. You used the word formation earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is one of the ways it's formational. People are picking up very specific understandings of like incarnation, mm-hmm. resurrection, mm-hmm. ascension. Thank you for noticing that because oh, that's I'm, all I'm, very I'm, intentional on yes, my part. Yes, of course. Of very course. intentional, yeah. Yeah. Um, ha, and then coming off of that, I guess my question is, is has writing litanies, has that, has that forced you to dig? Has that, has that awakened even more of a, a desire to dig and to... to to become a student of like Jesus and theology. I don't know. I'm, I'm just, I'm assuming it would, but I don't know. How do you approach that? I I feel certain that, uh, that I love Jesus more for having done all written, however many hundred litanies and certain that I, that at least I understand him better than I did before. And and some of that comes from, okay, so for the last three years, I have had a practice of every week following along with the lectionary. Do I need to ex- explain what the lectionary Go is? Ahead. The lectionary right. is, the, um, is the schedule of readings that churches all over the world follow. And it's a three-year schedule, year A, year B, year C. And if you follow along with it, you will, you will receive, you'll get the highlights of scripture, not every single passage of scripture, but for sure the highlights. And so every week I sit with the lectionary and it, it's like doing, like I do Lectio Divina every week for the lectionary. And I'm like, what does it say? And what are the themes? And, and how do, how do I, how do I distill it? Yes. And a lot of times those passages go together. They're amazing how how they fit yeah. like puzzle pieces. Yeah, that's it's right. Beautiful and amazing. Yeah, and it's, it's a lot what of times it's... else is amazing is how they speak to the current moment. Oh, so every single week. It's amazing. Every week without fail. Well, and a lot of times there's uh, let me see, Old Testament reading. Yeah. New Testament reading. Psalm. Psalm reading. And a gospel. Yes. So there's there'll be a a let an epistle. Yes. And then a gospel. Yeah. So you're getting old and new. Mm-hmm. You're getting gospels and psalms. And so often the old and new are just mirroring one another. They just that's right. They just hold up a mirror, that's and right. then they hold up a mirror to our culture and our society and everything that's happening yeah. with the wars wherever, and the politics wherever, and the yes. shootings wherever, yes. and the corporate greed that's happening wherever, and yes. the injustice. Beautiful. Well, and one of the things that I've noticed about your writing, I guess this would be another way to say <clears throat> what I've noticed in your writing, especially the calls and responses, is that you have a scripture soaked imagination. That's the way I would call oh, it. Yeah. I think I do. Yeah. I think no, I, th- right. I know you do. Yeah, I do. You've sat with you, you're telling me, yeah, I sat with mm-hmm. these scriptures, I do Lectio. Yeah. Well, it's showing now mm-hmm. because you, yeah. you're distilling, regurgitating bringing up those Bible yeah. ideas 
in an imaginative way mm-hmm. and giving it poetic language that just keeps telling the gospel story over and over and over and Thanks. over. Thanks. I received that. <laughs> yeah, dude, it's, it's really yeah. great. Mm-hmm. I, I, I love it. I always know when I'm around someone who's, who's had that practice because there's a, there's a spark of um, imagination and also just freshness you know, mm. uh, that doesn't come unless you sit with the scriptures. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can you talk to me about that practice? Like, I mean, is it just you read it and sit with it quietly and think about it? Or is there anything else that you do? Well, I'm, I'm real big on meditation. Mm-hmm. So I really try to, if not every day, most days, be just sit and be silent and offer myself into the presence. Yes. Well, um, and try to not have a, too much of an agenda about that, but for it to be a priority. And, and like everybody in my house knows when mama didn't meditate. (laughs) So like, it's a, like, that's real important for me. Um, so silence, number one and practicing silence. And then that, that week, that Lectio Divina, that sacred reading that does look really simple. It looks like reading and then staring at the ceiling for a bit, maybe taking a walk, maybe, I don't know, writing a grocery list or something. But you're holding space for those yeah. words yeah. to do something to you. Yeah. And sometimes uh, someone asked me this yesterday. Well, do you, do they, do you edit them? Like, do they, do you revise? Do you edit? And well, sometimes they drop out of the sky and then sometimes they come with a lot of midwifing and like pushing. Yes. <laughs> so... It's not always the same. I love it. I love it. I know, <clears throat> and I've told bits and pieces of this story many, many times, even on the podcast and, and other forums, but I know there was a, there was about a, there was a several year moment where I had a, a, a pretty profound, like faith crisis that got me to the spot where I just couldn't pray anymore. I just, mm-hmm. just couldn't do it. I've been there. Because I wasn't sure that God was like a great person. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I just don't even know if I want to talk to you. You know, yeah, if, you're kind of mean. If you're <laughs> Are real. You mean? It's like I, I kind of worked it in my brain. I was like, well, I don't even know if there's anybody up there, so what's the point? And if there is somebody up there, I'm not sure that his character is good, so what's the point, right? I, mm-hmm, I was kind of yeah. living there. No, the torture part was I was preaching every week, right? <laughs> Which is great. <laughs> but then I, after a couple of years of, of really not praying, I came back to prayer, but I came back to prayer by, by simply adopting a practice of, of sitting with Jesus. I, I'd kind of come to a point where I figured, I don't know about a lot of things, but I know Jesus mm. is a life worth mirroring, yeah, a, a life worth considering and loving. And I can't, <laughs> I cannot get away from him. Right. And so I would, I would just sit with Jesus. I would just I would just start a prayer that would just said, um, I would say, Jesus, it's just, it's enough for me to be here with you. And I wouldn't say anything else. And I would set a timer usually for like 10 minutes. I would just sit quietly with Jesus. And it's interesting. I started doing that and it started bringing life to my soul and to my body. And it actually healed me in, in, of some things and healed me of some of my just existential pain. I got a very, very clear word from Jesus, but just reflecting off of your story of, you know, sitting quietly, sitting quietly with the passage, sitting quietly with the Bible, sitting, not really bringing an agenda. You said not bringing an agenda. Yes. That is so, that's been so formational for me. Yes. So formational. Probably those are my, those are my main two formational practices, this, this sitting in silence. And I didn't start that in with any earnestness until 2015 when I had a really hard year in my family. My family went through a lot of trauma and just a lot of emotional pain and a lot of just difficult hardship. Yeah. And I would not, I, like I say, I could not have survived that year and kept any faith if I, if I hadn't just hung on tooth and nail to that practice of silence. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing how that works. It's amazing how less is more. Mm-hmm. It is. Yeah. It's also interesting to me that in a space where you don't use words, you get words. <laughs> that's 
There isn't there always a paradox in the most it. important lessons in spirituality? I love that. <laughs> yeah. You Thank sit you. in a space of no words and it informs your, I think your vocation of writing words. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, love it. Love it. Love it. Fran, I think you're a gift. Well, thanks. And if you are not familiar with Fran and you don't know what we're talking about, you can go to your website, Fran Pratt. It's just FranPratt.com. That's right. Mm-hmm. P-R-A-T-T. Yep. Yes. I have I w- a Patreon. Yes. And so my Plug weekly it. writing comes on to my Patreon. So for less than the price of a cup of diner coffee, you can get everything I write every month. That's very good. Yeah. You, can, you should you should get a job on NPR. Yeah. <laughs> that's my little plug yeah. of that. And I also have a book yes. that's available. Yeah. And you should get the book. It's on Amazon. We have several copies floating around here at our church and we use them. Uh, almost weekly, you know, we use them to just inform the words that we want to pray. I'll tell you what, Fran, let's end with this. This is how we end all of our podcasts here on The Ferment uh, with this question. Can you just, can you tell us about a time you experienced great joy? Well, the one that's coming most to my mind is a mixed bag. Yeah. So I was ordained on September 2nd of last year, 2018. And right after my ordination, which was, which happened over a Labor Day weekend, which was very joyful for me. Well, this is not the moment I'm getting at, but... Yeah, we're coming up on a year. Yeah, it was very joyful. But right after that, I, uh, my grandmother was dying. My grandmother was passing away. She had had dementia for many years. And my mom called me and she said, I think we, I, th- I think it's time. So my mom and I drove to where she lived in Louisiana and we, we sat vigil with her the last six days of her life. And it was terrible and it was gut wrenching and it was hard and it was messy and, um, not a pleasant experience to, to walk through this, the, the circumstances of her particular passing. But I'm getting to the joyful part. This doesn't sound joyful, but I'm getting there. So her pastor, who has been her pastor for 25 or 30 years, was out of town. He was out of town, like somewhere else, and wouldn't be there to preach her funeral. And my response was, dang, if I'm letting some stranger up in here. That's right. Oh, no. That's right. (laughs) Also, I just got ordained ordained. last week. Hello. (laughs) And so I had this like this mixed bag of joy and pain and like privilege and honor of officiating my grandmother's funeral as my first act as an ordained minister of the gospel. That's right. That is what I did. I officiated my grandma's funeral. I think it's prophetic. And I know that doesn't sound joyful, but. Like one of the best privileges of my life. I think the word privilege is a perfect word there. Yeah. And so that I think I think I'm still getting joy. I'm still grieving her passing. Yeah, of course. Processing it all. But still there's this joy that I could step in and that I had whatever authority that I needed to be able to do that. that I love that story. Yeah. Um, Just to tack one little thing onto that. I I often tell people my favorite thing to do as a pastor is weddings for people I know and, and funerals for people I know, you know, I re- I totally resonate that with, because the most intimate space that we get to hold with people is the funeral. It I really is. Nothing comes close. Yeah. 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 Same. That's a great story. Great deal of joy. Yeah. Great story. Great story. Well, Fran, thank you for talking with us. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for sharing just your process and thanks for your writing. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for reading along. And That's right. That's yeah. right. All right, everybody check out what Fran has to offer. Otherwise give somebody around you a high five and a hug. All right. Peace. Hey everyone. Casey Corm here, producer of the ferment podcast. Just wanted to remind you to check out our new single, Jesus Beautiful, wherever you listen to music. Here's a couple more things you can do to help us. Share a link to Jesus Beautiful with a friend, and also subscribe to our Sing Together playlist on Spotify. This is where you'll find all of our latest singles. Thanks for helping us get the word out, and we'll see you next time. Peace.